Hi everyone and welcome. Um, we're just letting everyone into the meeting room now. If you can just let us know if you can hear us by just popping a quick uh, yes into the chat box, that would be wonderful. Uh, brilliant, oh, that's great. Thank you everyone. Oh, it's always nice when people can hear us. Thank you, lovely. We're just gonna wait another minute or so to get everyone into the room. It takes a little while to sort of bring everyone in in that waiting area and then we'll begin. Just bear with us for another half a minute, minute or so while we uh, just bring everyone in. I can see all, all the numbers increasing, so lovely. Okay, looks like we're kind of fixed there. So I think uh, we are ready to make a start. Thank you, Beth. Fantastic, thank you, Kate. So it's brilliant to be with you all today. I'm so excited to share insights uh, from the panel. Having had the chance to spend a little bit of time with everyone before now, um, I can tell you you're in for a real treat. So uh, let me just first introduce myself. My name is Beth Robotham. I'm the Deputy Chair of City Mental Health Alliance. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And I've been involved in City Mental Health Alliance for a number of years. And I'm really excited that we're starting to have a broader conversation because the truth is we're all just more than one thing. And actually our mental health is influenced by all things to do with our identity. And we're gonna come on to um, share some of that um, insight from different people's experiences with you today. For those of you who don't know City Mental Health Alliance, we are a business community who uh, is about 10, 11 years old um, and have been really driven by business leaders, mental health experts, and a broad range of people to really drive new standards, um, set new expectations, learn, educate, share best practice. So it's perhaps no surprise that you will see some events and um, toolkits and guides from us that branch into the area of diversity. Now diversity covers a very broad range of things. Um, and today in particular, we're gonna focus on LGBT plus. Um, and I'm sure again, you know, that in itself is a very broad, topic and so you know it's important to say that um, everyone is an individual and has different experiences and you're going to hear about some of those today but we're certainly not uh, proposing this represents all experiences of people who are lesbian gay bisexual or trans um, all from the broader community but the reason we're focused on this topic is because unfortunately the data is quite shocking in this space and I'm certainly not going to um, get into anything here that should cause anyone any um, sort of distress from a a trigger perspective, but the, the the data around the LGBT plus community and mental health is very challenging. We know that that community are at increased risk of having mental health issues um, and staggeringly receive less support from the healthcare community and in particular some data from Stonewall around um, experiencing discrimination whilst using healthcare services. So, you know, as someone myself who has accessed healthcare services for my mental health, I cannot imagine what that would be like to then experience discrimination as part of that process and the bravery and determination it would take to keep going to get the right support for yourself. And actually some of the trans community have shared that, um, again, as part of a Stonewall um, survey that they were told by their GP as sort of going through that process that the GP didn't have enough experience about um, the trans community to really support them, which again would be a really challenging place to be. So just taking a step back for a second, when we talk about intersectionality, we really mean that this point that everyone is more than one thing. And actually importantly, that um, we, we will learn by hearing about people's experiences. And so I'm really excited to introduce you to the panel today who, who will kick us off by sharing just a few thoughts about themselves and their journey. Um, but uh, so let's kind of get stuck in. So first we'll have Liz Grant over ye, who is, pretty much an LGBT extraordinaire, has significant experience um, across different industries and working with business leaders and communities to help drive better inclusion practices. You know, she's helped set up awards. She's been on the board of Stonewall um, and will share some of her great experience with us. We're also joined by um, Andre and he will talk to us about his work at Financial Times, where he is, a, I love his business title actually. He's a customer success manager. Um, which does pretty much what it says on the tin, but also drives and supports a lot of their diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, so thank you for joining us early in the morning as well. And then we have B joining us. B is a consultant and solicitor at Deloitte, 
and is head of their um, diversity and inclusion globe network, which focuses on LGBT plus. Um, and she's a trans inclusion leader there. And so she has some fantastic experience to share with us. So you've got a brilliant panel. And so Liz, perhaps I'll just hand over to you just to share with us a little bit about your experience so people get a sense of um, what they'll hear from you today. Oh, Liz, you're on mute. Isn't that hysterical? I only do these things all day long and that you're on mute uh, call is, is so familiar, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Beth, that was a lovely introduction and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, I have been talking about things to do with LGBT for a long, long time. Um, and I know that um, particularly I was going back to a time when I wasn't out and I've been out for a long time. I've been um, out at work, um, I would say for uh, well over 30 years. Um, but, you know, earlier on, um, I really resisted um, this notion that I might be uh, lesbian. I probably thought, it, you know, at a pinch, I might get away with being bi uh, rather than uh, lesbian because I felt that that was kind of, uh, for me, a lesser thing. And I, the last thing I wanted to be was as different as um, I thought other people would think LGBT people were. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that come to mind, uh, Beth, when I think about the difficulty at that time and the courage that it takes to come out. Um, I felt really guilty, really guilty that I wasn't being honest and being myself. Um, and that manifests itself in quite a, an interesting way. I'm naturally a show off, I'm an extrovert. <laughs> Um, you know, I am very uh, used to and have been since I was seven years old and I was in a singing competition. I'm a bit of a show off. Um, and when I was coming to terms with coming out at work, um, I found that I had a real problem when, I, when it came to presenting. Um, and it wasn't so much that um, I... It was that I didn't feel I was being honest with the people that I was standing up in front. I was pretending to be something that I wasn't. And so that made me feel um, very guilty and very uncomfortable. And, um, you know, frankly, self-loathing. I absolutely loathed myself for being this person who wasn't being honest. And I suppose the other thing was um, that I was really afraid. And I was afraid because I thought I'd be rejected or I thought I'd be laughed at. Um, and I, I think those things are still, uh, albeit that was a long time ago, um, I think those things are still true today. Um, I was working with uh, one of my clients, an investment bank here in the city, only last year speaking to uh, a young woman who was really struggling with the notion that she might, it might be possible that she could come out at work. And I thought, gosh, nothing much has changed. Um, and one of the things I know that we said was the fact that, and every all the all people who are LGBT on this call, and many others who who I think have a good understanding and empathy for us, know that that's a decision that we make every day. Every day, am I going to go that little bit further? Guys, just come in to to clean the carpets in the house here. This is true. He's downstairs now, and. He said, oh, uh, you know, are you Mrs. Grant? And I said, well, no, obviously, no, no. And he said, well, maybe it was Mr. Grant that, and I said, no, 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 there is no Mr. Grant. You know, it's a small thing. My partner is 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 Kate, you know. Um, and so uh, you, and half the time you think, do I bother? And, you know, just come in, you're only cleaning the carpets. Let's not make a big deal of it. Um, so, you know, I think it's, interesting this coming out thing i don't think it's any coincidence beth that lots and lots of lgbt plus people experience anxiety clinical depression a panic attacks um you know because of those things i was talking about the fear and the guilt and the worry and you know you'll also i'm sure be familiar that uh, homophobic crime is on the rise um, so, you know, homophobic hate crime. So, you know, um, yeah, it can be a bit challenging. The relief is immense. 
when you come out, the relief that you can be yourself. Yes, you've got to be on, on the guard, you've got to be um, aware, but it's like a huge weight comes off your shoulders. Thank you, Liz. Andre, we'd love to hear from you next. Yeah, um, well, thank you so much, Beth, for uh, the introduction and for having me on the panel today. Um, and kind of to echo what Liz says, um, coming out is an incredibly just personal, but also like it feels like a monumental just task. There's so much you keep inside when you're when you're in the closet. You don't want anyone to know, you know, your sexuality because you might potentially lose friends. Um, but on the other side of that as well, I think for me, a big fear was um, after coming out was the idea that the perception of who I was is in a sense like gone, like a part of you dies, that part of you that people, you know, think they knew like that, oh yeah, he's gonna, you know, go off and get married to a woman someday. And, you know, all that, all the things that come with that. Um, and so for me personally, and like my experience um, growing up in Southern California, um, there was like a good portion of my life. I attended church. So that's a big experience too. in like the African-American community, um, like black churches definitely have a certain culture to them that, you know, disclosing your sexuality is a really, really big kind of, you know, taboo in a lot of ways, at least um, that's the perception. And in my experience, that's kind of the case in a lot of congregations. So I definitely had these pressures where I was very afraid to, to even like think about it. You know, I was thinking like, oh, I can just kind of bat this to the side. This isn't a thing like I can kind of move on from this, but um, I pretty much made the decision after college, um, pretty much I was about 22 and I literally just, the first time I came out was to my mom actually, um, because she, my whole life had actually, um, you know, watched stories on the news um, about kids who, you know, sadly took their own lives um, for, for things like, you know, being gay and being ashamed of that. And she would always kind of say to me like, oh, you know, if, if you are just like, let me know. And I look back on that now, that it was, it's kind of funny like how she was like almost more progressive than me in that sense like saying like yeah just like let me know and it just felt really good though to know I had her in my corner um, but even even with that support and I acknowledge that that's a really really amazing and powerful thing to have a mom who even before you say anything is kind of giving you that space and for so many people who don't have that I know friends who have lost relationships with their parents for coming out um, it can be a really, really um, just terrifying thing and just full of anxiety. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway from coming out is just realizing that it doesn't really matter how much support you have. It's always going to be a really personal and kind of tough decision because you're making a choice to say like, hey, this is me. Um, and I am still the same person, but it does change the perception going forward. And in the context of coming out at work, um, I, so I actually moved to New York literally like a week after coming out. So it almost seemed like I, you know, lined up my timing just well enough to tell everyone, okay, I'm gay and run, run across the, the United States to, uh, to New York City. But the, the process for work was a little bit more organic as well. Um, I didn't immediately disclose my sexuality because I just didn't want to be put in a box. Um, and also I just kind of had this whole experience of coming out to my family and, and some of my close friends back home. So I just really kind of didn't want to repeat the whole process again. Um, but then kind of to what Liz was saying that, you know, you make this choice every day. Um, the thing I would just want to, you know, enlighten anyone who, who's not aware is coming out isn't an experience that you do it once and then it's done. It's a constant kind of, you know, combination of big and small decisions to disclose your sexuality to people. Um, if they ask you a question of who you're dating, it's like a choice, like, do I say, specifically like I'm I'm dating or seeing men or do I say just generally like describe uh, characteristics uh, characteristics of of the people I'm seeing or say nothing at all so it's just this constant process of letting people know because when we live in in a culture where the predominant sexuality um, is heterosexual and and in the case of, of those who are trans where the predominant like gender um, structure is cisgender you always have to just struggle with the the idea that you are a minority and people are just going to assume by default that you 
identify with the majority if if it's not um, readily apparent. So yeah, it is a it is a lot. It can be a lot of mental weight, but the release is incredible. And I think so much has come from coming out for me that I could just be much more myself. And it has really actually helped me manage and kind of deal with some of those anxieties. And, and overall, it's helped my mental health as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's, there was so much that you covered there that we'll come back to. But I didn't want to miss the chance to say that your mum's already sort of a superstar of this call. One of the first questions was just about how amazing your mum is. So um, uh, that's always a good start. So B, it would be fantastic to hear from you next and, and some of your experience. Sure, yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for putting all of this together. Um, my name's B. my pronouns are she and her. Um, and as Beth said, I'm a consultant and solicitor at Deloitte. Um, I'm not actually the, the head of the um, LGBT network, but I am the trans inclusion lead. Just need to, in case uh, anyone from Deloitte is on the call, I wonder if I've, if I've <laughs> taken someone else's role. Um, Two, two things come to mind and sparked by what the other panelists have said, really. One of them is, is the issue of disclosure. So I'm a trans woman um, and I have, in, in most contexts, I have what's known as passing privilege. So for those of you who aren't aware, it, it's not an exclusively gender-based concept. But it's the idea that someone from a minority group can move through a majority group being perceived as one of them. So in my case, as a trans woman, I would be perceived as being cisgender, i.e. The, the gender I present myself is the gender that I was assigned at birth, which creates a whole set of issues around disclosure because it's similar to what Liz said in, in the sense that I, I don't have to correct people. I don't have to come out. And sometimes finding the ideal moment to do so, well, sometimes that ideal moment doesn't present itself. But inevitably, the weight that is lifted afterwards, the relief is just immeasurable. But I have to qualify that because in the UK at the moment, trans issues seem to have reached the media um, in a way perhaps reminiscent of how lesbian and gay issues reached the media several decades ago, which means that the situation for trans people is actually in incredibly challenging in terms of safety. And having making that decision to disclose for me is often one based on safety. And I'm very lucky to work in an environment where I have been able to disclose, actually prompted by the events around George Floyd's murder. Um, and since then, my confidence has grown, my productivity has grown, my, you know, my ability is, I've just begun to thrive. But the thing that I wanted to mention was from a mental health perspective that there's this sense of a split inside of, I, I didn't grow up in a supportive environment. I'm from a Moroccan Jewish background. And so I concealed who I was for most of my teenage years. And then when I did come out, I was kicked out of my family. Thankfully, those bridges have been rebuilt now. But the effect that that has upon one's sense of self and the complicated associations that it forms, the sense of something being wrong and punishment for being who you are, it means that that dis decision on disclosure, it can often be really, really weighty. And it can, it can be... A, I don't know to someone who's outside of the LGBT community or perhaps to someone who's not trans, it might seem like quite a, a simple thing, but the fear of how you might be reacted to is very, very real. And not all reactions are positive. 
Um, so, yeah, a bit of a pro and a bit of a con there. <laughs> but, yeah. Thank you. And I think you, you all raised some really important topics when we talk about culture, ethnicity, faith, um, obviously sexuality, gender identity, but there is some there is some practical issues as you raise and that you know the experience for trans young people of um, violence or verbal abuse and I read something that said that um, more than half of people had experienced negative comments in the workplace or negative behavior so you know it's incredible to hear you all share your experiences but we have to be honest that there are some significant challenges for us um, to all get behind and make sure that we're driving change which is hopefully what we'll do together today in terms of sharing more information and experiences. So let's um, shift next, just to think a little bit about intersectionality. So you've all shared a little bit about your personal experiences, but what other complexity does intersectionality create from, from a workplace perspective or from sort of your experience um, in the different industries that you work in? Um, help us understand that complexity a little bit more. And Liz, perhaps you go first for us, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I think this notion of intersectionality is, is uh, so important. And actually the term intersectionality is a very recent term. It's only recently surfaced. And I think it's been a really helpful way of being able to frame the difference that all of us bring. And I, you know, in, this point about disclosure that V mentioned is absolutely critical. And Andre mentioned his, his faith. Sometimes, you know, I say I'm a lesbian, I'm, um, I, I manage um, mental health, I had a, a Catholic upbringing, um, you know, I am the adult child of an alcoholic, I was born on the other side of the world. And all of those things I think are components and of course, I'm a woman. Uh, all of those things are components that make up uh, who I am. I think the key thing is um, the only um, generalization you can make about intersectionality is that everybody's different. Um, and be prepared and understand that. That's why in the work that I do, if we look and people, you know, this whole notion of, um, you know, white, uh, middle-aged men and let's just it's a ridiculous notion to suggest that that all white middle-aged men are the same they are as different as each of us um, and you know that's that's the other side of intersectionality too so um, I think you know if if the exam question is what have what have I seen in workplaces that really helps build LGBT inclusion um, I think there's a balance between things. By the way, I can talk about this for a long time. So, you know, just pull the brakes on when you need to. Don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll politely interrupt at the right moment. <laughs> okay. I always talk about there being a carrot and a stick to diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, the stick is, says, you know, hey, we've got a framework of legislation that protects our rights at work, the Equality Act. Um, you know, we have a whole series of um, other um legislation that's in place and and workplaces all good employers have got some really great um policies that they implement and that's you you must have those in place so that's kind of like the groundwork of what needs to be in place from there it's looking at how do we encourage people to talk about and make lgbt a perfectly normal um part of uh, workplace culture. I remember um, some years ago, the CEO of the company where I was working uh, before I set up my own practice um, had a, was running a leadership meeting and astoundingly in the year about 2000, he used the words lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. And you know, this was a bit earth shattering because people can very quickly go LGBT, LGBTQ and you sort of shove it into an, an, an acronym. But if you actually use the words, it makes quite a big impact. You start normalizing it. And you know that's when you start looking at things like 
role models. We've got to have people in the organization who are role models as LGBT plus people and who are role models as LGBT allies. Those are all really important things. We start using the terminology, we talk about it in all of our communications and we can identify um, role model leaders, both allies and from our community within the organization. I think those are really important things. I think the other thing is, you know, you want to foster sort of some really good cultural characteristics of openness, of, uh, you know, and encouraging courage of producing a psychologically safe space that people can, can be in and talk to, where curiosity, a healthy curiosity is valued. And, you know, for me, those are the, probably the bigger challenges that employers have today. Um, and I think it's absolutely critical um, that they build this uh, framework, if you like, where difference can thrive. Because to Andre's point, and to B's, and for myself, when people can be themselves, they absolutely blossom. They thrive. That is just, and it's a wonderfully empowering thing. Um, and it, that was certainly my experience. So I'm Brilliant. going to stop there because I'm sure other Thank people... Thank you. No, that's well. incredibly helpful. And I think one of the things that I try to do as a leader is make it okay to correct me. Um, you know, I work really hard to make sure I'm using the right language, but I may not get it right sometimes. And it's completely fine for people to say to me, actually, Beth, you know, that's not how you pronounce my name. Or actually, Beth, that's not how we talk about the trans community. And I say, thank you so much. It's not your job to do that for me, but I'm completely open to that to make sure that we're all learning from each other. So Andre, maybe Very we'll fun. come to you next, if that's okay. Because I want to stick on this point about belonging that um, Liz raised, and you do a lot of work on inclusion and diversity at the FT, but talk to us a little bit about how you create that community sense and why that's so important. Um, yeah, so when it does come to belonging, um, Obviously all of us have a need to, to connect with one another and to really be heard. Um, but I think the key thing with belonging is just really feeling seen. So for me, the work is so important because, um, you know, struggling sometimes to juggle different identities, um, you just wanna know you're not alone. And you also wanna know that people just understand your experience. So things like this panel where people, you know, attend and you get the chance to actually hear and learn from each other, it's really empowering because you suddenly go from this whole internalized like conversation, anxiety, and kind of thoughts of like, you know, how do I deal with this or, you know, what's going on? Like, how do I, how do I manage this? How do I cope? Um, and when you realize that there are other people out there listening to you, it can kind of be one very uh, cathartic because you're just, you can get it out there. You can express kind of the, these pent up like pressures and, and trying to really understand and unpack your own kind of thinking using other others is, is almost a, a sounding board. Um, but more to that as well, um, it helps you, I think, to be as an individual, be a little bit more bold and actually con conveying or um, I'm losing my words here. Sorry, guys, it's like 8am here. But you you kind of it helps you to communicate your needs more. So so just for example, um, when it comes to intersectionality, as we were kind of talking about earlier, um, everyone has so many different identities and those different hierarchies can play out um, differently as well. And for me personally, like growing up African-American, you know, my race is an identity that I literally, I wear, I carry it. So it's not something I, I can hide. And it's also something that's always on display. And that for me, it's just become so normal. Um, I don't really feel the same level of, or at least at the time, I didn't feel the same level of, you know, shame or kind of feel like need that I need to, to hide this while simultaneously saying like, I also, you know, need support. You know, there are certain challenges I face as an African American that I really need your help with. Um, but that identity is just worn and it's out there. So it more naturally helps me, you know, to seek those, um, to seek those advocates in society that are going to come and obviously like they see me and we can work together to see like okay like what are some things that would actually help the broader the broader community and so in that same way i think just when it comes to belonging 
companies can do so much just by, again, having employee networks where you can let people come together and form groups to really work on different initiatives to champion and raise awareness of different communities. And where you bring intersectionality into this, and this is what I really love about the FT, is we have started over the past year, especially after the, the murder of George Floyd, to really try to have layers of intersectionality in everything that we do as individual employee networks. So for example, the Pride group, um, Proud FT, we did a series on race and um, gender and sexuality. So we did kind of like three in one. And the same thing happens when we do other groups like FT Mental Health. It's like always trying to find now the different layers to it. Um, because at the end of the day, that saying, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, you know, the more that we all kind of take our intersectionality and different identities, we can actually help advance everyone's position. Um, and I would just say again, like to tie that back into belonging, even those who are, you know, maybe cisgendered, heterosexual, um, you know, you, you have an identity that is very complex. It's not just you know, this generic, like, oh, you're the majority. So you can really lean on your experiences, like those parts of your identity that may sometimes leave you feeling disenfranchised and, and kind of vulnerable and use that to help create empathy and connect with other people. Um, so you can help, you know, ultimately raise everyone's, you know, voices and, and kind of lift everyone up. So that way we can all come together and really create that sense of community. Um, so. So that's why I'd say, you know, belonging is so, so important, especially at work. We're spending eight hours a day there. Um, so let's like really, you know, let our employees and each other know that, you know, I see you, you're seen and you belong here as well. Brilliant. Thank you. I think um, I read some really interesting research recently that being a part of a community is very protective for your mental health. So if we can create communities at work that people can feel included and as you said create a sense of belonging actually that can be something an employer does to actually enhance and be proactive about protecting mental health um b i'll come to you next if that's okay and thank you for correcting me that i promoted you um i think you should you should be the lead though by the way so if anyone from deloitte is on please uh, suggest that to people involved i'm sure i'm sure the actual lead is excellent but um I would love to see B doing even more, but B, what, what would you add from a workplace perspective and how do we do a better job? Because as you point out, the, 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 the discussion and education around trans communities is newer than some of these um, other topics, which are incredibly important too, but, but how can we all support our colleagues, um, you know, be better managers and, and what should we be thinking about from a workplace perspective? Yeah. Um... I think that there are simple things that can be done, but I think the first, the first step is removing the fear. I think that the, I'm going to focus on, on trans issues, um, as, as that's what I know I'm, I'm closest to, but the, from a trans perspective, the, an environment of fear has developed in this country. Fear of trans people, uh, trans people frightened of cisgender people, fear of asking questions, fear of asking the wrong question. From a trans perspective, fear of violence, fear of all sorts of things. So the first thing to do is get rid of that fear. And you get rid of that fear by, by seeing others as people and as complex people. So it's like the other two speakers have said, you don't get to choose not to be intersectional as a human being. You just are. Everybody is. It just happens. So if we take the, the kind of the, the, the mythical straight middle class white man as a, as a starting point, the mythical homogenous individual. Um, those identities are still, they're still identities that intersect with each other and they still intersect with other people's identities. It just so happens that the way that society has evolved has meant that those identities move through society more easily than other identities. So the first thing is to take away the fear and kind of flatten things a little bit and say, okay, you're straight, that's no better or worse than not being straight. Okay, you're cisgender, that's no better or worse than not being cisgender. But it does mean that if you're cisgender, you may not be as educated about transgender issues as a trans person is. 
And that's okay. There isn't a lot of education that goes on. It's often on trans people to educate others about it. But I think having that healthy curiosity, having a sense of respectful inquisitiveness and taking it upon oneself to self-educate, but in a cautious way. Um, you know, I've got to speak from personal experience. In the UK specifically, there is, there, there are not, there is not very much trans positive reporting in the UK. Um, and at the moment, the trans community are undergoing quite a lot of legal challenges. So the trans community feels quite defensive at the moment. As someone who socially transitioned quite a while ago, and certainly socially transitioned before it hit the media headlines, I moved through my life quite, quite, it was quite straightforward, really. <laughs> I wasn't frightened of using the bathroom or anything like that. No, I am. No, I actually am. I'm actually scared. I'm scared that I might, something in the way I, I appear or speak or might, might make visible my gender difference. And with the way that media is reporting at the moment, I'm worried that that might be taken away from me. People might attack me, people might insult me. I might be told that I need to use the men's toilets, for example, which I'm not sure would be the safest place for me. Um, so I think having that, being mindful of that, being respectful, being curious, realizing that the author is probably as frightened of you as you are of them. And the last thing I'll say on that is there are simple things that can be done in the workplace to help flatten that. Um, I don't want to say flatten the curve <laughs> on today of all days, but there are simple things that can be done. One of those is putting your pronouns in your email signature. It's a really simple way of saying, I acknowledge that being, say, cisgender is part of my identity. I'm going to put my pronouns in there as a gesture of solidarity and inclusion with those who aren't cisgender. I'm going to acknowledge that pronouns aren't, aren't natural and divinely ordained in that way. They're not just automatic. In the same way that it's not enough to be not racist and we're working on being anti-racist. Um, it's similar with, with educating yourself about the trans community. Thank you. Um, I think when we were doing our prep, you mentioned something that I thought was really important, Bees. If it's okay, I might just ask you a direct question on that. But And then for the other panelists, I wanna just come on to talk about the impact of COVID and lockdown. And then we're gonna to come to questions. And I can see someone's coming in already on Q&A, but please do keep adding. And for anything that we haven't covered, I'll make sure that we cover that. But you talked about um, the, 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 the challenges of media reporting and sort of, and that how that can sometimes impact someone's day, um, how it can be quite triggering. And I suspect that's true for a broader range of topics, but would you just talk about that for a few minutes for us, just so that people can be thoughtful as employers about how we, should be thoughtful about what's in the news and how that might be impacting people. Sure, yeah. Um, so stepping away from the, um, I, get, I don't want to get into the, the politics or the, 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 the discussions around whether, what the media should or shouldn't be doing. It's, it's not what I'm here for, but just looking at it subjectively. Um, I'll use my own experience. So I'm a trans woman. I go into the news in the morning to see what's going on in the world. There are a lot of things that are upsetting. Um, for most people, every day when they look at the news. But I would say at least once a day, maybe once every two days, and certainly every day on social media, there will be something quite threatening. So that might be news of murders. It might be news of rights being pushed back. It might be critical op-ed pieces written by those outside of the trans community. Um, it might be, and then in social media, it might be Facebook posts by people. It might be comments on posts. Anything that is even dimly adjacent to transgender seems to stir very strong opinions in people 
who are outside of the trans community. And it can be very difficult on a personal level, not just for me, but I know for many of my friends as well, when we share news stories with each other, we, we content note to the heavens, you know. We say, we even share things and say, you know, maybe you don't want to look at the Times today, or maybe you don't want to look at this newspaper headline today, just to try and protect each other, because it's not about having a thin skin, it's about it being the latest in a series of things that have been painful. So if I see a news article which is critical of trans people, or maybe equating us with being dangerous or something like that, I might, it might then go back to my experiences where, without going into too much detail, I have been the victim of violence, and I've been the victim of sexual violence. Now, someone outside of that might not know that, but the statistics show that I'm not a minority within the trans community. We're all getting more educated now with the idea of microaggressions. But the thing that I want to make conscious in this discussion is that when someone from a minority community, and in my case, trans community, feels that microaggression incredibly painfully. It's not just because of that microaggression in isolation. It's because of the history of that person. And I think from a workplace perspective, to situate that in the workplace, I think it's important for colleagues, allies, managers, leaders to be mindful of that, to be mindful of what's going on in the news at the moment that could be affecting my trans colleagues. What can I do to reach out to them to just to kind of metaphorically put, on, put an arm around them and say, you're feeling okay. Do you need to take an hour away? Do you, do, you, do you need a bit of time out or something? Do you need to talk about it? Just to call, to call you in and to help get you back to that state of equilibrium so you can be yourself again. Thank you for outlining that so thoughtfully. And I think, you know, there's, there's a huge amount in there, but I think for all, if we think about some of the race events, you know, Asian hate crime um, that's risen significantly, you know, we're seeing all kinds of horrible things in the news. And I think raising that point about how we can be sens more sensitive, acutely aware, um, and, you know, see that's part of our job as people managers, that actually what's happening externally may be impacting people. And so we should be really thoughtful about that and, and reach out um, if we can. So. Moving on to the final sort of um, question before we go to the q and I wanted to just get your thoughts about, you know, from a mental health perspective, COVID and lockdown, and it depends, you know, where we are in the world, what stage of lockdown we're in and which wave we're on and, you know, where we are on the vaccines. You know, mental health has been a big topic for discussion over the past year. And in some ways, COVID has created more opportunity for us to talk about mental health. Um, and some of the challenges but equally we know that it's created you know issues for some people we know that in the in the UK at least it's predicted that 10 million people will need support for mental health as a result of Covid um, and that's 20% of all adults and 15% of all young people you know some of the people would have been receiving help before but some of those people will need new support and so if we layer intersectionality across that you know we, we recognize that going back into our homes or back with our parents or um, you know, being with our partner or family sort of more full time in our houses or maybe living alone. Like I would love just to hear your thoughts about the impact of lockdown. And, and again, anything you think that practically we should think about from an employer perspective. Um, and for this one, I'll just open and see who wants to sort of provide any comments. I'm happy to kick that one off. I mean, I, th I think what's really interesting about um, COVID I mean, lots of things, obviously, but the fact that we have been video conferencing so extensively, we have learned far more about the people that we work with um, than, than we did prior to this. You know, we know about their homes, we know about their kids, we know about their dogs and their cats and, the, you know, um, and that has required a real openness, I think, on behalf of everybody and respect um, around that. Um, 
And I suppose I have a real hope that as we rejig ourselves to whatever the new normal is, we don't lose that openness, a kindness, if you like, um, that people show to one another and an understanding. Um, because I think, you know, it would be wonderful if from an LGBT perspective, people were less judgmental and more accepting. And I do bring that back to that positive sense of curiosity and support and recognition that, you know, there's an awful lot going on every day in people's lives. I think if you look at when we worked in the city or what have you, you know, we all went into a little block every day. We were actually, we were trying desperately to look like one another. We even wore, wore the same clothes. And, you know, what the pandemic has done is it's sort of thrown that open. Um, and I think that's one of the most wonderful things that's come out of it. But let's not lose that. That would be my hope is that we hold on to what we've learned about collaboration and understanding and we continue that in whatever the brave new world looks like. You use my two favourite words there, Liz, kindness and hope. Um, and I hope a lot of that comes out of this discussion as well. Would anyone else like to add anything on the, the point of lockdown and COVID? Um, yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, I mean, I think Liz pretty much summed it up pretty, pretty well. Um, but just in terms of what COVID for, you know, people who are, have been working remotely for the past year means, um, at least personally, from my experience at the, the FT, it's really actually helped to reduce some of the silos. Um, I mean, ironically, I think a lot of people that I would normally see physically in the office, um, that's, that's been less. I haven't seen a lot of people I would normally like catch in the kitchens um, or just for, you know, random side chats. But I have seen a lot more of my colleagues globally um, in London, in Europe, in Asia, um, a lot of early morning calls um, with, with some colleagues in, in Hong Kong. And it's really just been great to see how much more we do collaborate across just regions um, because we're, we're all remote. We're not really going anywhere as much. Um, like Liz was saying, we get to see each other's like homes and, and kind of um, family members sometimes. And, and you kind of learn a, a bit more just about people and their interests. Um, you know, the countless times you've seen pets or you see like cool little souvenirs in people's corners and it really just humanizes everyone uh, in a way that I don't think we had as much before COVID. So yeah, if we could keep that element of it, um, even when we go back into the office um, and really just start, you know, just bring ourselves to work and just, you know, looking at your colleagues and being like, hey, you know, we all just went, this is really traumatic <laughs> like year. Um, and there's probably gonna be a lot more to come like in, in various forms and, you know, as we readjust back to normal just to really keep, if we, if we keep anything from, from the past year, you know, hopefully we move past a lot of things, but if we keep anything, if we can hold on to just that empathy and just really just say like, hey, when we come to work, you know, all my colleagues are people too, like they all have their own struggles, their own experiences, um, their own families, their own lives. Um, and how, how can I be someone who, um, you know, really lets them feel, you know, welcome here and, and lets, you know, my, my fellow colleague just like, no, like, you know, I see you, I'm listening to you, you know, approach me about anything, you know, like I've seen that funny picture you have on your wall. So like, let's talk about that. And just those like little, little things as well. Um, I think it'll just be something great that we, we bring with us out of the pandemic. I love that idea of kind of keeping the conversation going and starting small. I think that's really important. Be anything you'd like to add before we go to the Q&A? Yeah, just very briefly, just to, first of all, just to echo everything that um, Andre and Liz have said, completely agree. The one thing I would say as well is, I know that we're, we're hopefully, fingers crossed, starting to return back to um, some kind of hybrid of what it was before and what it has been during the past year. But I encourage people to be mindful that that transition won't necessarily be that easy for everybody. Um, you know, I'm someone that has a lot of anxiety generally, got my own mental, other mental health problems as well. And I'd hate to see people just, I don't, the messaging is very much, you know, 
this unequivocal good of hooray, everyone's going to be outside, there's going to be crowds of people, it's going to be wonderful. But for, um, for people, for, for me and for several people I know who suffer with things like me or struggle with things like me, that isn't as straightforward as it might appear. Um, it needs to be a gradual thing. There's a lot of anxieties that go with, with that. It's taken quite a long time to adjust to lockdown <laughs> and it might not just be as simple as flicking a switch and going back um, going back out there in a psychologically and an emo in, in a psychologically and emotionally healthy way. Thank you. That, that raises a really good point. Um, and as we think about intersectionality and the difference in experience and actually, you know, even returning to the office from an identity perspective could be quite challenging if you've got new teams. So if we think about you know, our organisation, we've had lots of people join us over the last 12 months who may have never even met their team sort of in person. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we know about mental health issues in professional environments is a lot of masking happens. And we've heard some uh, themes today about people not feeling comfortable to share every part of their identity. And so actually, you know, we should be thoughtful about those people that maybe haven't come out um, to use a very broad term and making sure we're being really thoughtful about that as we go back to the office too. So we've had some really great questions. So you've obviously inspired people a lot. Um, but one of them I really liked, which is about, um, and I'm just going to say the first name of the person, I won't say the full name. Um, uh, Stephen raised that we've, we've talked quite a lot about sort of inclusion, um, but given that we're all different, you know, it's interesting that we're made to feel that we're not the cultural fit where, you know, so where is the inclusion here? So if we think about, um, I saw some organisations who have different um, diversity networks actually sort of collapsed them and said, we're just going to have one network, which is about inclusion of all types of people and experiences and backgrounds versus having separate groups. Because actually, you know, creating separation, albeit as a community aspect we talked about before, could be unhelpful. Um, so I, th I think that's sort of an interesting question about like, how do we get to a point, do you think, and is it necessary to get to a point where we don't really focus on the differences because we're all different and it becomes about sort of an inclusion mindset versus activity? Um, and Liz, I might start with you if okay, because I guess you've done a significant amount of work in different types of organisation, you know, across some time. But, mm. but maybe the question is like, what does Nirvana look like in the future? Like what, what should we all be aiming for from an inclusion perspective? Because it may not be the model we have now. You know, it's such an interesting um, topic, this uh, employee resource groups or network groups and how we've kind of vacillated. We've gone from, we need them to be all individual and quite siloed to no, no, we only need one and we just must make sure that we get the, a sufficient focus on each of the different matters. And that's now kind of reverted back now to no, 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 we've got to go. Uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is. All I do know is that an organization needs to make sure that inclusion for everyone is what it stands for. It needs to talk about its values resonating for that. It needs to create a, an environment where everyone can feel valued. I do think it's important that um, there's an opportunity for the nuance and understanding of difference from each different constituency, if you like, is, is that opportunity is given so that people do get to understand all the differences, but it's gotta be against a backdrop of, you know, everybody's welcome, everybody's included. And, um, and then, you know, and we've talked about it repeatedly today, this notion of intersectionality, which says we're a bit of a mosaic. We're made up of all these different facets. Um, I liked what Andre was saying that at the FT, that they would have events that might go across one or two or maybe more groups. And I really, really um, think that is extremely helpful. And it's part of the way we encourage our clients to work as well. Thank you. Um, and I think, a, you know, a comment has come in from someone to say that, you know, everything about a company needs to be inclusive for inclusion programs to really be totally. effective. And it's a really good point. And um, I told this story before, but a, a senior member of the City Mental Health Alliance board once said, you know, you can do all of this great work around mental health activity, but you only need one senior person to roll their eyes at the wrong moment. 
and everybody knows that it's not authentic and actually you know they should be cautious and I guess that could apply more broadly as well and so you know our ability to get involved in different inclusion activities as leaders is really important because we're sending signals all the time about our commitment to inclusion, our commitment to, to, you know, supporting different identities that may, you know, exist within our um, teams. And I think, you know, one of the things we we often talk about is, you know, whilst we employ an individual, you know, their family experience will be impactful for them. And so it may not be them themselves, it may be a brother or sister or a parent. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do this year is make some of our events available to employees' families. Um, because actually, you know, the content is very relevant from a mental health or a diversity perspective. Um, and so that's something that we could all think about as well, because, you know, this, people are, are not an island um, and, you know, are very reliant on their different family structures. So another question we had, which I thought was interesting, um, is actually something I'm quite interested in at the moment around when we, when we talk about different topics, it could be quite triggering. So that's something that we've been very thoughtful about today. And I would just say that um, there are some fantastic organizations online listed on the Stonewall website. If there is anything from an LGBT plus perspective that you found difficult or is stirring a particular memory or experience for you. Um, but when we talk about, it's really important to talk about difficult things in the workplace. Um, do you, any of you have any advice about the right way to do that so that it is comfortable for everyone? And I think the specific question was about the difference between a trigger warning and a content warning. And I, I guess each question that gets asked, I kind of make it my own. So apologies, it's probably not a good moderator. But I guess I was thinking about it as in if you're going to be talking to employees about difficult topics, you know, how do you make sure that you use a trigger warning or a content warning appropriately? Um, and, you know, do you have any advice around that to make sure that we don't sidestep the difficult topics, but at the same time, we do that in a safe way? Any thoughts? B. It's a good question. Um, the way I've seen trigger, trigger warnings and content warnings used, um, I'm not entirely clear on the difference, to be honest with you. I think they both, to me, open to be corrected. I think they both kind of serve a similar function of just alerting people to the fact that there's, there's things being brought up that could be difficult. Um, I, I actually don't think you can use them too indiscriminately. I think a generous use of them is the way to go. So I don't think one should be too concerned about using them in themselves. As for how you use them, I think if you are if you are discussing anything which could be sensitive, now sometimes you're going to get it wrong. You're not always going to know what could be upsetting for everybody. But there are certain topics that, if they relate to violence against the person, if they relate to bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, those kinds of things, it makes sense to 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 note those. And the way I would suggest and Again, others, other panelists might have better ideas on this, but it's to simply say something like, we're going to be talking, or this discussion is going to bring up some topics that some people might find difficult, such as A, B, and C. Um, what would you like? You know, if, you, if you'd like me to, if you'd like to stay here, we, when we come to those topics, I could flag it, and you could leave, we can do that. If you'd just like to stay, but you're happy, you know, ask those people really the mm -hmm. whole point of it is to note that there could be something upsetting and then give the agency to the people that might be upset to say okay i'm gonna exclude myself or i'm gonna stay brilliant thank you and i'm, I'm conscious of time um so in the prep i did give you all for warning that something that i have seen to be incredibly impactful um in this space is making sure that we're building strong allies um who are learning and supporting but I would love just to hear a final thought from each of you about how we can all be better advocates or allies for the LGBT plus community, either as a whole or individual specific groups. Um, uh, Liz, would you mind going first for us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that um, if you see things that you know are not right uh, uh, when people are perhaps engaged in banter, 
or um, which is, by the way, just a, a nice way of saying verbal bullying. Um, you know, is that you say, I don't think that kind of language is right around here. I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I would love to see allies standing up a little bit more um, and not being passive, but actually being an active ally. Brilliant. Love it. Andre. Um, yeah, I would, I would just echo what Liz says. And then also to add another layer of, if you want to be proactive as well, don't just um, you know, speak up to the things you think are wrong, but I, top suggestions I'd say actually are what B mentioned, um, pronouns. Um, that can go, it's a really simple thing to do, but it can go miles and miles to just make people feel more included and know that the organization, you know, doesn't just, you know, assume one thing or the other. Um, the other don't assume people's sexual preference or sexual, um, sexual orientation based on, you know, your own biases. Like, don't say like, oh, who are you seeing? Or like, oh, all the girls must love you. Just either don't address it or kind of just be neutral or just say what, who's your partner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last thing is really just be interested in, in learning. Um, I don't think it has to be such a difficult task to like study and like go and it's like, oh, well, what do I have to do to unlearn all these biases? Just like go get more engaged in the LGBTQ community um, the same way any of us would, you know, engage with, um, you know, for, like a friend or, or learn more about their culture or background just get more exposure to it. And then you'll just build that knowledge and you'll probably find things about it that you relate with as well. Brilliant, thank you. And B. Yeah, they're fantastic. I just echo exactly what the other panelists have said. Being an active ally is really important. Um, pronouns does go a really long way. Um, and just to echo what Andre said as well, educating yourself doesn't need to be this heavy academic thing. There are, there are things on Netflix. I always recommend Disclosure on Netflix as a documentary, which is a really good insight into the trans community. There are plenty of other things out there, podcasts, things that are actually quite fun and engaging um, and will just help to broaden allies' understanding and horizons and also equip allies with some of those language tools and confidence that they might have been lacking. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you all from all of us for your incredible experience and insight and openness you know I have personally learned so much from working with you all and I know that our audience um, would have found it inspiring compelling and we had some great comments as we went through I think um, I think one of the things that we can all do as an effective ally is you know making sure we're learning making sure that we're hearing different experiences and not making assumptions as you said um, but I think we have to create space don't we to hear about different topics and actually, you know, making sure from a mental health perspective, something that's really important is to make sure that the services that we provide as employers are able to support people from the LGBT plus community. And that means having representation from the LGBT plus community. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that um, we focused on because we were aware that actually for some of our services, everybody was white you know, that wasn't intentional, but actually that was gonna be a barrier for some people in reaching out. And so, you know, it's really important that we think about this in the context of the mental health support that employers provide. Um, but I did just wanna say thank you so much to you all. Um, and let's end on Liz's point about, you know, there are significant challenges, but there's also lots of hope um, and it will probably be driven by kindness. So have a wonderful day and we look forward to interacting with you all more in the future. Thanks everyone. <laughs>